Uh, if you have a Bible, you can open to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, or if you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's page 972. I hope you all had a good week. Uh, it's been a, a long week for me, not anything in particular, but just you ever have one of those weeks where it just seems like it goes on forever. Uh, we're in a collection of messages called Stories Jesus Told, where we're looking at some stories that Jesus told. So it's a really creative title. Uh, uh, so we're, we're going to look at, we looked at one last week, and then we'll look at another one today. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Uh, our Lord and God, we thank you for today, and we thank you uh, for this communion of saints that you've brought together uh, to, uh, to worship you. Uh, I thank you for these brothers and sisters uh, and now we especially are thankful for your word and for your son, and uh, we pray that you'll use this time to open us up uh, to fresh understanding and, and fresh thinking on your word, and, and that through this, you will draw us closer to yourself. And we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen? So as a general rule, human beings like stories. We like to tell stories, and we like to write stories. We like to sit around the dinner table with friends and tell stories about what happened in the day. We like to watch movies. Uh, we spend however many billions of dollars a year going to the movies. Uh, we like stories way better than we like propositions and, uh, and, and dogmatic statements. And I would say we probably like stories even more than we like poetry, although poetry maybe is like a, a runner-up. Um, but I think we like stories because we experience life as a story. Uh, we use stories to communicate something about who we are. And at a, at a cultural level, different cultures tell different stories that we find to be more important, that, that shape who we are. So for the last, oh, three or four months... Uh, every night I, I, I read stories with Macy when we go to bed, and uh, we've been reading classic children's books like Charlotte's Web and Wizard of Oz and uh, Alice in Wonderland, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like these classic books. Because there's something about classic literature that this represents something about the, the warp and woof of American culture. Uh, we, we want to make sure that our kids know the story of the little engine that could. And that's not as important in other places in the world. But in America, that story tells something about what it is to be an American, about industriousness and hard work. Right? So stories capture something and they define who we are. And, and I think Jesus understood this. And that's why he used stories to teach as often as he did. He would use stories to... Uh, to try to shape the way that we perceive the world. And he would tell these stories of his, his own creation. And the stories that he tells are not just meant to entertain us. No story worth its salt is ever just meant to entertain. If you go to a movie and all it does is entertain, it wasn't worth the you know, $38 or however much you spent on your ticket. Uh, if a movie is going to be worth anything, it needs to do something more than just entertain. And that's what Jesus does. He does more than just uh, make us smile or laugh or something. He's trying to teach us something. He's trying to challenge the way that we see the world, the way that we see God, and the way that we see ourselves. And so this morning, we're going to look at one of Jesus' more famous stories. It's one that he tells in three out of the four Gospels. I don't believe that this is in Luke, or sorry, in John. Uh, but Matthew 13, we'll start in verse 1. It says, That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. 
So a few weeks ago, I was starting to work on this passage, and uh, I, I told the story to Macy because she has two children's Bibles, and this story isn't in either of them. And so I thought, this is an important story. I'm going to tell her the story. And it's not until you tell the story to someone else that you realize how bizarre of a story this is. For one, there's only one character, and there's no conflict There's very little plot. There's no rising action. There's no climax. There's just a guy went out and planted seed, and some fell here, and some fell here, and some fell here, and some fell here. The end. It's if you're looking for an entertaining story, this is not the story to go to because it's not very compelling. But just that, it should tell us that something else is going on. Also, I don't know a whole lot about farming. But I'm fairly certain that when you go to plant, you don't just stick your hand in a bag of seed and just throw it wherever, especially if there's a sidewalk nearby or rocky soil or something. You probably prepare the soil, and you probably try to make sure that your seed lands in the good soil. You don't just all willy-nilly throw your seed everywhere. And then he also, he says that the good seed produces anywhere from 30-fold to 100-fold. So from one ear of corn, you're getting... 30 to 60 years of corn, or to to 100. And I don't know what modern farming techniques can do, but in the ancient world, this is unheard of. Normal would be like sixfold, maybe as much as tenfold if you had a really good bumper harvest that year. 30 is unheard of, and 100 is just hyperbole. So you've got some seed that the birds eat, some that just withers and dies, and some that the sun scorches, and then some that grows beyond your wildest imagination. And there's nothing in the middle. So all of this should make us think, I think something else is going on here. I think this story is about something else. There's something going on under the surface, uh, which is often the case in Jesus' stories. So the disciples think, that something else is going on here. And so when they get a chance, they ask him the story about the, the, the guy throwing his seed all willy-nilly. What, what was that about? So verse 10. Then the disciples came to him and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, that is to the crowd, it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they've closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and didn't see it, and to hear what you hear, but didn't hear it. So, I think that pretty well clears up the parable, doesn't it? Let's, need I say more? Let's pray. No, uh, I think this makes it even weirder and more obscure. He tells this strange story, if you can even call it a story. And then he starts talking about if you have ears to hear and hearts being dull and I'm telling stories so that people won't understand what I'm talking about. It's very bizarre. This whole thing is very weird. Now, if you read the book of Matthew from the beginning, you start in chapter 1 with the genealogy, and you're just reading from cover to cover like you would with any book, you'll notice that chapter 13 is the first parable that Jesus has told. Now, he's had other teaching, notably the Sermon on the Mount, and some of his teaching is kind of hard to understand. It's cryptic, or it sounds like a riddle or something. But this is the first time that Jesus tells something that would qualify as a parable. As, as a, a, a good word for a parable is a, a riddle. It's a cryptic, they're not, not all parables are stories. Some parables are just, a, just like one sentence. So this is the first time that he's 
said something like this. And the disciples come up and they say, Jesus, this is getting a little hard to understand. Do you think maybe you could keep it on a level playing field? Because there are people over here who don't know what you're talking about. Not us, uh, but these other people, they don't know what you're saying. And Jesus agrees that some people are going to hear him and some people won't hear him. Some are going to unlock this story. And for other people, it's just going to be strange and useless. And for Jesus, the difference between those two groups of people is the posture of their heart. Whether their hearts have grown dull and unreceptive or not. And Jesus says that he is using these parables to deepen that distinction. You see, in chapter 12, just before he does this, the Pharisees have decided that they have had it with Jesus, they've had it all the way up to here, and they're going to have him killed. They start plotting his demise. And so you have some people who have heard the teaching of Jesus, and they have responded with faith, and they have wanted to to follow him, and then you have other people who hear the same message, and they want to kill him. And so Jesus tells parables to make that distinction wider so that those who don't believe will continue to not believe and those who do believe will be able to hear what he's saying. And an important word in this whole section is the word to hear. And in Hebrew, now Jesus, this is written in Greek, but Jesus doesn't speak in Greek. He's probably speaking in Hebrew. And for in Hebrew, the word for hear is the word shema. And so he's telling, if anyone has ears to Shema, let him Shema, let him listen. Does anybody, does the word Shema sound familiar to anyone? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu. Uh, the, The word Shema is not just to let sound waves go into your ears and you hear. The word Shema means to listen and to obey. The same way you might say, uh, listen to your parents. Or I listen to your advice. It, it's not just, yeah, I listened to my parents, but it sounded terrible. I'm not going to do that. But I heard them. I heard them. That's not what Jesus has in mind here. For Jesus to hear is to listen and to obey and to respond in faith. And so whether or not you do that depends on the posture of your heart. If your heart is open to Jesus like his disciples, then you're going to get the story. And if your heart is not open to Jesus, it's going to be totally lost on you. And then the interesting thing is, then he explains the parable. Because Jesus isn't just here to recognize the posture of people's hearts, but to change the posture of our hearts. He's here to take people who are opposed to him and who are hard-hearted and calloused and transform us into people who shema, people who can hear and listen and respond in faith. So he explains the parable. Look at verse 18. Hear then the parable of the the sower, Shema, the, the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So this, Jesus identifies the seed that's being planted as the word of the kingdom. Now what is the word of the kingdom. Uh, is this the message of salvation by faith instead of by works? Is this the story of the crucifixion? Is this the, the message about the resurrection of Jesus? What is the word of the kingdom? Well, the good news is we don't have to guess because Matthew tells us what the word of the kingdom is all the way back in chapter 4. In uh, chapter 3, Jesus gets baptized by who? John the Baptist. And then he goes off into the wilderness for how long? 40 days. And then he comes back into civilization and he starts preaching. And Matthew gives us a synopsis of his preaching ministry. And this is what it says, Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everything Jesus says or does from this point forward is all about this. It's all about the message of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Every miracle that he does is the kingdom coming. It's God's will being done on earth the way that it's done in heaven. Uh, Every teaching is about how you can make heaven or make the earth look a little bit more like heaven. 
because heaven is invading earth. You see, Jesus believed that in his own body, the, uh, the fullness of God, in, in his life and in his teaching and in his ministry, in his death and in his resurrection, something was happening that represented a seismic shift in human history. Something not cataclysmic, but something, uh, the, there was a watershed moment going on in Jesus. And he calls it the kingdom of heaven being at hand. And so somehow in his coming, earth begins to look a little more like heaven. The two are slowly being fused together. I put it like this. The kingdom of heaven is what it looks like when God gets his way. What, does, what would the world look like if God had his druthers? Well, it would look like people who are blind seeing. And it would look like people who are sick being made well and people who are dead being raised. Uh, it would look like people learning how to love their neighbor as themselves. It would, it would look like Jesus and the kinds of people that Jesus calls us to be. That's the kingdom of heaven crashing into earth. It's, uh, it's society being organized justly and it's temperance and it's self-control and it's people who've experienced this fundamental change from impurity and idolatry and jealousy to people of love and joy and peace and patience and so on. So this story that Jesus tells about the sower has something to do with the way that people respond to the message that in Jesus, heaven is crashing into earth and that the world is becoming more and more as God wants it to be as people are transformed into the image of Christ. How do people respond to that? Okay, back to chapter 13, verse 18. Or sorry, verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So different people are going to respond to Jesus in different ways, the way that soil responds in different ways to this seed. And one way that people respond to the message of Jesus is that they just don't hear at all. They don't shema. The sound waves go into their ears, but they don't listen. They don't respond. It never takes root. They, they don't become people of faith of any kind. It's like trying to convince them to listen to Jesus. It's like trying to convince people to change their politics through Facebook arguments. It's just not going to happen. And the reason is their hearts are hard, compact soil. The reason is their hearts have grown dull. Other people respond like rocky soil. Verse 20. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So there are some people who hear the message of Jesus and they respond. Uh, you know, uh, does anybody watch American Ninja Warrior? Or heard of the show? Okay, Katie and I like to watch American Ninja Warrior. What this is, is people who are super fit and athletic doing super fit athletic things. Just running this obstacle course. And, and if they, they love to tell you the stories of like the moms and dads who decided to do it for their kids or people who've overcome adversity or whatever. But it's this really inspiring show of people who have kind of decided they're going to get fit with, with, and, and they're going to do this. And so when Katie and I watch this, Every season, I get all hyped up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm not going to become a, a ninja, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get fit. It's so all go out, and I've, like, I installed a pull-up bar in the garage because I'm going to start doing this. Right? And then what happens? Like two weeks later, I'm back to eating nachos and pizza and stuff. <laughs> because this wound up being a whole lot more time-consuming and a whole lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Can you... Do you you understand this. You've had this kind of experience. For Jesus, some people respond to the gospel that way, that they immediately, they hear the sermon or they're in the Bible study or whatever, and they get all inspired. I'm going to follow Jesus. And then two weeks later or two months later or two years later, they're nowhere to be found. And the reason is that those people encountered the message in an environment that was lacking depth. 
And maybe it's, it presented the Christian faith as something that's easily mastered, and all you have to do is just this thing, and then you're done. Or maybe uh, they, they encountered it uh, hearing that Jesus would improve the quality of their life, and that's just patently false. <laughs> Following Jesus doesn't make life better. Uh, well, it doesn't make it easier. Or they get into it, and they find out that this is a long road, and it's hard, and it's difficult, and it's painful. And Jesus says tribulation or persecution arises like the scorching sun, and they fade away. And in times of trouble, their diminutive little faith has very little to offer them as a means of coping with the persecution or the tribulation. The realities of life smack into them and cause them to stumble. And then there's the weed-ridden soil in verse 22. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So some people hear about Jesus and the message of the kingdom crashing into earth, and they believe, and they, they genuinely believe, but in the end, they still get choked out. But this time, the problem is not the absence of depth. This time, it's the presence of something else. And my Bible calls it the cares of the world, or your your Bible may say the worries of the world. See, Jesus understands that life is fraught with cares and worries and anxiety, things that don't just distract us, but actually disturb us. Like, what if I run out of food? Or what if I don't have enough clothing? Or what if, and you can fill in the blank, we live this life that centers around worry and concern and and this deep anxiety. And then Jesus comes in. And for some people, Jesus is perceived as a personal problem solver. He's the one who's going to make sure that I have enough. And if I follow him, then I'm going to make it. I'm going to be okay. If I just give my allegiance to Jesus, then I can kick back and I can relax. But what they discover is that also isn't true. Life with Jesus does not guarantee ease or abundance. In fact, it often guarantees the opposite. And that can be really disorienting. Like, I thought I had my future all locked up, but now I'm starting to get worried again. And in those moments, Jesus understands the cares of the world will lead us to some other Savior. Specifically, he mentions the deceitfulness of wealth and money and riches. It's not just riches that choke the word. Jesus says it's the deceitfulness of money. That is, money tells you that it will solve your problems and it will heal your anxiety and it will uh, provide a better future for you. But the problem is not your financial situation. The problem, the more fundamental problem, is the posture of your heart to, that you have failed to listen to the coming of the kingdom. In, in these moments, we think that money is going to solve all of my cares and all of my woes, and Jesus says, it's a lie. It won't solve anything. And then there are people who respond to the message of the kingdom like good soil. Verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So some people hear and they listen and they obey and they pledge their allegiance to this new way of being in the world. And eventually they produce fruit. Now what is that fruit? What is it that comes out of a person when they give their allegiance to Jesus? Well, Jesus' message, the word of the kingdom was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance is the appropriate response to the message that the reign of God is coming to bear on the world. Uh, Repentance is a change of behavior that's motivated by a change of the inner person, a change of the the posture of your heart. 
change that is motivated by shame is not really repentance. Change that's motivated by expediency, and it'll work out better for me if I do, is not repentance. Only when it's the result of a changed heart is it repentance. So repentance is turning away from one thing and turning toward something else. I used to be this way, but now I'm going to be this way. I used to do this, but now this is the kind of thing that I do. Repentance is becoming the kind of person that Jesus calls us to be. It's about the transformation of the entire person, about learning to live our lives as though we were actually members of the citizen, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. It's not that they, they don't ignore the message of Jesus. They don't lack depth and wither under trouble. And they don't believe the lie that money is going to solve all their problems. So there you go. That's the riddle. That's the story that Jesus tells. People respond differently to the coming of the kingdom. Now, what's interesting about the story to me, and I've read this many, many times. Jesus doesn't say, go ye and be the good seed or be the good soil. He doesn't say that. It, it, Jesus doesn't like just give us a punch in the arm like that's all we need and like, hey, just a reminder to be this way. That's not what he's doing. He's not telling us how to be. He's just recognizing how people are. And he's labeling how people behave and respond to him. It's like Jesus is saying, this is how the world works. And then he's inviting us to find ourselves in the story. This story calls on us to take inventory, to take our spiritual pulse. Where are we in this? This isn't about, you ought to be this way, although I do think, obviously, he's not, he doesn't want you to be any of the other soils. But he's not calling on you to be the good soil. He's calling on you to check, where are you? Maybe, as you're listening, you want nothing to do with Jesus, and you want nothing to do with this message. And why is that? Is that because the message is wrong? Or could it be that it's just that your heart is calloused and, and that you've, you've been packed down and, and become just unreceptive to it? Is this an issue with Jesus or is this an issue with you just don't want to listen because it's not good for you? I think the story calls on us to ponder, how would I respond under adversity, under trouble, persecution, when it hits the fan and things get stressful or volatile, how do you respond? When the sun, when the, the scorching sun blazes on your life, do you ride it out or do you abandon ship? You just crawl back to your old ways because this didn't pan out the way that I was thinking it was going to. And also, I think we should find ourselves asking, what am I anxious about? What are the cares of the world that I'm concerned about? And not just what's on my to-do list, what's on my mind, but it's like, what are you afraid of? What are the things that you're afraid of? Are you worried that someday you're not going to have enough? Maybe a, a helpful way of going about this is asking yourself, why is it that I get up in the morning and go to work? Why do I bother putting in the time and the hours and the energy? Is it because if I don't work, I won't have money, and then I'll really be up a creek? Because then money is going to be the answer to all of your problems. And Jesus says, that's a lie. Or is it because, are, are you capable of seeing your work as a participation in the coming of the kingdom? Do you get up and go to work because the kinds of things that you do and the people that you work with are, can in some way be leveraged for the advancing of God's will in the world, whether that's with your coworkers or through the very thing that you do in your work, that somehow you can bring the will of God to bear. This story demands that we ask of ourselves, how well does my life conform to the sovereignty of God? And in, in what areas do I resist God's sovereignty? Where in my own life does God not get his way because I hold on to it for myself? We identify those and we release them to God's control. Now, this, this whole thing hangs on one linchpin. It, it's all on, on this one thing, and that is the validity of the claim 
that the kingdom has come in Jesus. If that's not true, if Jesus is not actually the one bringing the kingdom and that hasn't happened and Jesus was just a quack or something like that, then by all means, carry on our merry way. Go off and and try to find your security in your money or in your work or whatever. Uh, Go and and, um, do whatever you think is going to work best for you. But if it's true that Jesus really does bring the kingdom of God to bear on the world, then we have to take inventory of ourselves. We have to respond with repentance But we're here this morning because of this conviction that we share that it is true. That Jesus has been raised from the dead. And that when Jesus died, he absorbed all of the pride and all of the anger and all of the sin and all of the hatred and all of the violence of humanity into himself. And he took it to the grave and then he left it behind. The resurrected Jesus is this first glimmer of this new life, this new creation, and this new way of being in the world. We gather together so that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper. And may we never celebrate the Lord's Supper as simply just to get it done. The Lord's Supper isn't something that God needs us to do. It's something that we need us to do. We need a reminder week after week after week that there is a new covenant and that God relates to his people in a new way. And that the kingdom of God has come to bear on the earth. And I am a citizen of a different kingdom. And I don't buy into the old way I have put on the new self. The Lord's Supper is a reminder that we have communion with God through Jesus Christ. And so may you hear this story that Jesus told as more than just some strange story. May you turn away from your old self that's corrupt and deceived And put on this new self, which is being renewed and created by the Holy Spirit day by day. And may you remember that the kingdom has come. Let me pray for us. Our Lord, we we thank you for Jesus. We pray that you will give us ears to hear and that you will soften our hearts. And we recognize that any response that we give to you Uh, begins with your initiative to us. So Lord, we thank you that you have taken the first step. We thank you that you have extended your hand to us and that you have poured out your love on us and given your life for us. We pray that you will draw us closer to your son. We pray that you will give us boldness in the face of adversity. And we pray that you will uh, keep our eyes focused on you when worries and concerns of the world crop up around us. We pray that you will transform us into the kind of people who bring your will uh, into being here. Lord, we love you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Love you guys.